In addition to those of us participating on campus, presentations in the Global Engagement Speaker Series are being live streamed. And we invite online viewers to, to submit questions or comments they may have for our speaker through the Zoom chat feature. We'll share those submissions during the question and answer portion of the presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Sandra Rodriguez Coco. Sandra is a journalist with decades of experience in Puerto Rico, the United States, and several Latin American countries. She works as a news and policy analyst, radio commentator, television producer, columnist, and blogger. She conducts her syndicated radio program on a series of regional stations that make up the Puerto Rico Information Network, is an analyst at radio station WPAB Ponce, and publishes a weekly column in the cyber newspaper Noticel. She's also a contributor to several media outlets in the U.S. and the public relations portal of Latin America based in Argentina. Sandra has authored several books on communication and journalism, most recently, Pitacora de una Transmisión Radial, Log of a Radio Transmission, Trabales Editores, 2018, chronicled during the passage of Hurricane Maria. She received the Bolivar Pagan National Literature and Journalism Award granted by the Institute of Puerto Rican Literature for her opinion columns published in Noticel and in her book on Blanco y Negro con Sandra in Black and White with Sandra, 2016. Sandra is a founding member of the Autonomous Movement of the Deaf and collaborates with the March of the Deaf, San Gabriel College, and others. She was a member of the Board of Directors of the Puerto Rico Community Foundation and the, of the Association of Parents of Children with Disabilities. She is the proud mother of a special 16-year-old girl. So please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, actually, I don't need this. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really humbled by this experience and I appreciate you coming to hear what I have to say and to share with me some of my experiences in, in life and in journalism and also in basically trying to reach out to the communities and sometimes give back and most of the time of the times learning from the communities what their experiences. So today I'm going to be talking from my point of view, my experience in Puerto Rico, as you may know, we have been under several, uh, I would say, atmospheric or some people call them crisis. I want to see them as opportunities. And um, I like to talk about that and what are we doing and how are we dealing with the situation in Puerto Rico. And I prepare a small video presentation that summarizes some of the things that we have been through. So let me go through it. This is the recent story in Puerto Rico. This Caribbean paradise has been with a decade-long recession and a $73 billion in debt that resulted in the imposition by President Barack Obama of a financial oversight board. People that were not elected by public vote are making all the economic decisions and imposing austerity. Then, on September 2017, Hurricane Irma came and affected the east coast of the island, leaving over 30 towns with no power and no communications. Two weeks later came the monster, Hurricane Maria. It destroyed everything on its path, leveling the entire island. Devastation was unprecedented. Nobody had an exact idea of the death toll. President Donald Trump came to the, the island and threw paper towels at the people of Puerto Rico. Government lied until a Harvard University study estimated the death toll on 4,645 people. Power grid went off for almost a year. People were dying and getting sick. Things went back to normal slowly. Then, on the summer of 2019, we, a group of independent reporters, uncovered hundreds of pages of a chat between the governor and his staff called the Telegram Gate. The people in Puerto Rico were offended with the vulgar, racist, and homophobic remarks and discussions on how to target potential political opponents. Artists such as Ricky Martin and Bad Bunny went to the streets demanding the governor's resignation. Day in and day out, people were protesting on the streets. 
every day was more and more the amount of people that gathered in different protests all throughout the island and in the diaspora. It became an international surprise, an international news. Con desprendimiento, hoy les anuncio que estaré renunciando al puesto del gobernador efectivo el viernes de la resignation there was a constitutional situation we had three different governors in a week's period finally then justice secretary Wanda Vasquez was appointed governor and then nos dio duro esta vez nos dio duro y así está San Juan el día de hoy solo muy poquitos edificios tienen luz la escuela, no sé cómo se llama, pero ciertamente colapsó, miren. Oh, 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 miren, ahora mismo, ahora mismo, esto es en vivo, miren. Oh. Aquí hay un problema más psicológico de la gente, la gente no quiere regresar a sus casas, la gente tiene mucho temor de que sus techos caigan, de que de noche vuelva a temblar fuerte como nos pasó el pasado. More than 3,000 earthquakes in less than a month have affected people in the southern and western coast of the island. Houses are destroyed, churches and schools completely leveled, and people are displaced and homeless. The land is still shaking as of today. Then by mid-January, a car-sized asteroid fell on the south of the island. Three days later, a space garbage from a satellite also came down in Puerto Rico. <laughs> piling up in Puerto Rico, but the real and undeniable situation is colonialism. So I try to summarize everything that has happened in the last few years. We had a, we went from a, a complete a devastation in terms of the, what nature has done on the island, but also we were coming from a 10 year economic recession Uh, almost 600,000 Puerto Ricans have left the island over a decade. And then we were hit by both hurricanes, the mismanagement by the government, the state government and the federal government as well, because some people from, even from the federal government and FEMA uh, employees are now being prosecuted for corruption, as well as some of the local employees uh, from the local government. And then we have the two hurricanes, and then we have the changing government because of the chat that was revealed by a, by a group of us, the reporters, the independent reporters, and then hello. And then um, afterwards we had uh, the, uh, the, her the, at the beginning of this year, the, the earthquake in the Southern coast of Puerto Rico, people were completely surprised. And then the, the, the very first month of the year, January, as I, as I mentioned in the video, there was a meteor I fell on, on the island, and then space, garbage, all stuff. People were thinking we were doomed. So you know what people did in Puerto Rico? On Jan the last day of January, they had parties all over the island to celebrate the last uh, day of the month. And we celebrated, for us, that was like New Year's Eve. So we had the party on, on the, uh, on the uh, last day of January because we didn't want to think about this. But the fun, you know, we try to laugh at adversity. But the truth is that 
that is what is going on in Puerto Rico and how we deal with those situations in terms of the public opinion, in terms of how the people are going to react. So that's what some of the things that I want to talk to you. And my main questions are, where do we go from here? What is the role of scholars and universities facing realities such as ours? And are journalists doing their job? Okay. I know that this university has a tradition of helping and reaching out to the communities. But in, uh, in this day, day and age, all the universities have a fundamental role. And I'm going to be talking about this. And I hope you get that information from my presentation today, OK? My, I'm going to divide my presentation in these five main areas. The changing landscape, the world, what I call the analog versus the digital world, and how the world is being perceived, the role of scholars and journalists, the importance of planning, and a couple of examples, OK? I'm going to start, as I said, with our experience in Puerto Rico. Um, in terms of everything that I have mentioned before, I, I have to say that even though we have seven uh, universities that provide very good uh, communications programs to students locally, and some of us that come uh, that have studied abroad go back to Puerto Rico to work as journalists or, or communicators or publicists or public relations professionals. The truth is that nobody, and, and I think that applies to all the universities, is, is, being, is preparing students to adapt to so many changes and so quickly. And the, truth, the, the fact that I'm doing this is, uh, we, we are an example in Puerto Rico because of hurricanes are a, and, and, and even the earthquakes are a result, a direct result of climate change. And it's scientifically being proven. I know some people are not, do, uh, people do not believe in climate change, but the truth is that we can see how the situation, the environment has been changing. And we're expecting uh, hurricanes to become stronger and more devastating. So in that situation, how do you react? In Puerto Rico, when everything went down, all the telecommunications were off, there was no internet. There was no power. Some areas in Puerto Rico remain without power for more than a year. How can you work as a journalist to provide information where there, there is no electricity, no power? You, there's no way you can find out what's going on because you don't have a, a website to find out if there's a, a need in another town. You have to rely on basics, on what I call going back to basics, the analog system. And we're, we can talk about a little bit about that in, later on. Um, I also noticed on this ex a recent experience in Puerto Rico that some of the universities and also some of the reporters and the local media treated her the situation, the earthquake situation, as if it were the same emergency as the hurricanes, and it, it was not the same. Of course, we have not experienced earthquakes in over 100 years, so it was brand new to us. And uh, my example, what I'm trying to say is that uh, right after the, the uh, earthquakes, government was basically shut down. They, they didn't know what to do because the, the land started to shake on December the 28th. And it was up until January the 6th when the big 6.5 earthquake uh, basically destroyed mo most of the towns in the south. Then the governor admitted, acknowledged that something was going on on the south of the island. They were having parties like nothing happened on the north. And, and even we, we felt some shake, but, you know, the... Uh, the last, uh, the, the most of the devastation is in the southern part of the island, not, not the entire island. So you know what people did? They ran, they went on their own cars, and they went to the south to provide aid with food and water and clothes. And we had a, a thousands of cars, and there was a traffic jam. And it was a... I mean, it was very beautiful seeing solidarity among citizens, but it was a safety concern because you never know if the earth was going to start shaking again. So that's one of the things that we have to learn uh, on, you know, on, on a continuous basis. It was not that clear for us journalists. And also, I, I don't think some of the journalists were prepared to deal with this scenario again. And that sense that you know you're facing against death you're again facing devastation the lack of government uh, uh, 
mobility uh, action that what I call the not, not again, not again syndrome, like we're, we're facing this again. And it was a general distrust on the um, government. A couple of weeks after the, a couple of days, I should say the, the um, first uh, earthquakes, we got a, at WPAB in Ponce, we got a, a, a leak at that station that there was this citizen journalist who went to a place where they were hiding aid and food and, and you know, and uh, milk for babies. And this guy is called uh, the El Leon Fiscalizador. And he did a Facebook, a live, a Facebook live uh, video out of the, out of the warehouse where they had hidden that aid and was, were not distributing it among the people in need, basically because they wanted to wait and distribute it among people that are from the, their same political party. You have no idea, it almost created a, a riot there. Police had to intervene. So people were really upset, really upset that that happened. So that's the, those are some of the things that we're, happen, we're seeing right now. And we're seeing in Puerto Rico more reactions from the communities, community-based. We act, we act faster than the government. And in that situation, we see some areas, we see uh, community-based organizations uh, acting quickly. Some of the churches, not all of them, but some of them. Um, and also, we see some of the universities as well. And there's another component, and I will say the, the, the famous people. And my question is, is, is it gonna be a repetition of the summer? The artist's involvement in everything that we, is happening in Puerto Rico is very important. You, you have people like, like Ricky, right, right there, like Ricky Martins and, and the uh, reggaetons and Luis Fonsi and Chayanne that they go and, and they go and Ricky Martin just opened a, a school down in the South for students. He's uh, helping students and he, he got into a program with several private universities to provide online education for the uh, junior and, and senior year high schools in the South. So that's a joint program with the education, the state education department, and seven of the private universities and the University of Puerto Rico as well. Lee Manuel Miranda and his father, they have been raising money and contributing in the arts and contributing in many other organizations. Uh, Mark Anthony has raised money and particularly during the hurricane, he was a bit more active than now. And, and Jennifer, I think she gave about a million dollars to Puerto Rico in charities during the first hurricane. And now during the, uh, the uh, halfway time of the, of the Super Bowl, you know, she, she had a mention there with a the, with the banner. Some people didn't understand what she was doing, but at least we have some representation there calling to what happened. But my question is, that's, um, our experience, that's, we live in the island of enchantment, how we call it, and we know for sure that hurricanes are gonna come and that situations are gonna, are gonna happen. Um, and as I said, it's, we were expecting something to happen because of the economic recession. We knew something was gonna happen, but it can happen anywhere. It can happen to the States, it can happen to you here. L look at, at, this, at the children around the border that are being caged. If you're a Native American, construction of the wall, the Trump's wall, has, you know, it turned down sacred places for, for the Native Americans. And you see politics the same. What we're experiencing in Puerto Rico, the same political bickery is happening here between Biden, at least in the Demo Democrats, Biden and, and Mike Bloomberg that is spending, I don't know how many billions, I think it's $5 billion on, on his political campaign, in his advertising campaign. Uh, uh, Bernie Sanders is going to Puerto Rico, I think in two weeks, or they're promoting him because they're in Puerto Rico, we, elect, we participate in the primaries elections. We don't participate and we don't vote for the president. Bloomberg has been several times to Puerto Rico. We have um, a president that has spent, I think he's the, uh, he spends $152 million on golf, playing golf. So my question is, as a reporter, or as a journalist, or as a community leader, how can you explain that there's so much emphasis in some issues that are superficial, and you don't go to, straight to the point and straight to the, 
what is really important. For instance, how many people had been could could have been cured of cancer or treated for cancer, treat for for cancer or for any other illnesses? How many people that are a experience hunger in America could have been fed with 152 million of U.S. taxpayers' dollars that the president is using playing golf? So those are the questions that I think the media ought to ask in this reality because we're, we're living on a changing landscape. The world is changing. A, a climate change is a fact. That's what we were talking before about how it's sometimes you feel it's not that cold here. And uh, there was a drought here in, in Michigan recently as well. So those things have to, we have to be aware that that's going to change our planet and that's going to change the way we behave and, and the way we interact in anything, in education, in, in social work, in, in journalism as well. So what is the role of the uh, academics and the journalists in this situation? My perspective is that academics have to be the guiding light in this process because there's so much information in the world. You have to serve as the, as the, as the teachers, become the teachers to the, to the public and explain what is going on. Uh, it's, uh, that's why academia is so important to deflect what is true what, from what is wrong, what is uh, a lie. In this day and age of fake news, I think it's more important than ever that universities take an active role and go out in the public opinion and, and become that, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, professors and the scholars become that, uh, that voice of reason to make us think what is important. And even calling, to, uh, calling out the reporters that are not doing their jobs and asking the correct questions, that's what the universities are, universities are for. So as I said, things are changing. Co uh, media companies are changing fast, and this is a worldwide trend. It's not only in Puerto Rico. Uh, you, you see, you, you have to think about the uh, pundits that are now working, operating on the media and the war against uh, fake news and, the, and you know, the alternative version of the stories and the trolling on, on social media. And uh, you have to realize that in corporate media in America and in the world, but particularly here, um, I think corporate media has been, become too rigid in terms of uh, responding to their, shareho their shareholders as opposed to the uh, common good. So the cost, they have been, they have become hostages of the cost structure that demand, demands cuts and work with less budget. And that has an impact on what the citizens are reading on their newspapers and reaching and getting on their TV and listening on the radio. So make, that makes the big traditional media corporations very inflexible, very uh, and very slow in responding to the ever-changing environment in the world. That's why, in, for my perspective in Puerto Rico, it was so hard for the traditional media to, even though they have the, the budget and they supposedly have, supposedly have the, the amount of, of reporters available and photographers to move quickly and cover the stories. And uh, they, for instance, what we happened when we did it during the summer with the chat, it was revealed by it was not revealed by the traditional newspapers and traditional media. So more, it was revealed by online and independent publications. And more or less, that's what's happening in the, in the United States as well. And that has an impact on what the public are consuming in terms of information. So the role of the scholars is now more important than ever. Scholars have to be out there. They have to be evaluating the trends and setting the agenda in the communications world. That's my, my perspective. Um, and also, we have to take into consideration social media. Social media can be often used for good, but most of the time it's, it's for the contrary. So where do you distinguish the truth from, the, from what is not? And, and I think that's where the universities have a special role. Um, in terms of the reporters, the reporters automate the tough questions. Sometimes a simple question is easier. And more, more important than, than anything else, use common sense. Ask a question that anybody will be asking. If I were to see Donald Trump right now, my question won't be, ah, oh, when are you gonna 
allowed Puerto Ricans to have money? No. My question would be, are you spending $152 million on playing golf? Can't you use that money somewhere else? You, you see where I'm going? What I'm trying to say is that you have to, reporters have to start asking the tough questions, going back to basics. And sometimes they, they go to the press conferences with so many ideas and they forget that they're serving, not their editors, they're serving the public. So they need to answer the questions that the public are making. And sometimes I think it's because we live in a, an, a, an analog, analog versus digital world. Some people are still thinking that we are a, we have to be slow, like the old technology, but we behave in the new era and the new digital technology. So why should I, why am I trying to say with this part? I'm trying to say that um, people consume what is happening in a different way and that news spreads so fast that something that happens here can be seen anywhere in a matter of seconds. Uh, right now, I've been, I've been following the coronavirus epidemic, and every day there comes a different story, and now they say that it's, a matter, it's not a matter of uh, when, it's a matter of how bad it's going to reach the United States, and the World Health Organization just said that it's going to become a pandemic. So what are we doing? Are we, getting, are we, are we preparing for that? How can we combat that? How, how are we, uh, do we have uh, the resources to deal with something that is happening in China, it could happen in, in America as well. So those are the things that we have to start thinking fast because we have the opportunity to see what's going on live on the other side of the world. <coughs> we have in the Dominican Republic right now, as, as we're speaking, a big controversy because the uh, late, uh, later, they, they had um, municipal elections last week and they had to postpone those elections because people were saying, that the electronic vote was, uh, was a fraud. So most of the students and, and young people went to the street to protest. And nobody in the main media basically covered the story. They were not paying attention to it. But you know why it became a newsworthy story and, and it reached the wor worldwide? Simply because there were some people documenting on the social media scene. So, it became, it became viral, and that's how they were forced to cover the story because some of the main newspapers were, you know, allied to the government and they didn't want to get involved in politics. And that's what, when I'm, what I'm trying to say about some of the media that became too rigid with the status quo, and they tried to defend cer center, uh, certain topics and they tend to forget what is important. Okay, so I gave you that example in Puerto Rico, an example in the, in the United States, that's in the Dominican Republic. In Chile, the protests in Chile started basically on the streets. People went on the streets and nobody paid attention. And then Piñera, the president, made some remarks and he even said that they were at war and people got upset and women were uh, talking about being raped by the police officers and the military and people were not paying attention to them and basically that fueled the indignation and the protest in chile they started uh about a, two or three weeks after the ones in puerto rico and they became violent they were shooting at at the particularly at the eyes at the students and many have lost their their sight so women also um started because of in, in chile in particular the protest started because they raised the the uh, price of the metro, the, the, the train. So they, they were against that. And they started, I don't know if you have seen this video. Have you seen this video?
n'est pas moi, ni les femmes, ni l'endroit. La coupable, ce n'est pas moi, ni les femmes, ni l'endroit. Le violeur, c'est toi. Le violeur, c'est toi. That song, what it means is that women, um, they when they are arrested or they go to a police station in, in, in Chile, they will make her put their hands here and bend down and they usually uh, rape them. So they, a group of performing artists, they develop that dance, which is called the You Are the Rapist. And I think that is a follow-up situation of what is going on here in America with the Me Too movement and other a movement that are trying to defend what, what uh, and, and go against a violence against women and, and some of the other situations, but th the manifestation is different. And, and you see women really angry in Chile, and those were the women, those were the ones who started the protest. We had them in Puerto Rico as well. So that movement has been and taped all over Latin America in each of the countries, and it has a very strong meaning. And I would say in Mexico right now, if you go and you see the news, three days ago, there are about 90 women killed every week in Mexico. And some of the feminists got really upset and they went to the president's uh, house and the palace and they painted graffiti outside protesting. So we are on a, on a verge of a different society, I will say, in some areas because people are really upset, are tired of being push up, push, uh, push down and, and you know, uh, mistreated. So how is the media going to respond to that and how the universities are going to respond to this, to this new reality, okay? So I, as I said, in, those are some of the protests that took place in Bolivia and Honduras after what happened in Puerto Rico and Chile and Ecuador, as in Ecuador and Venezuela as well. And those are some of the protests. But you're not far away. Here in America, the same thing, things are going. You have the Black Lives Matter. You know, remember what happened in Atlanta a couple of years ago? The hostility against African Americans, the rhetoric from some politicians, particularly Trump. Um, now I would say African Americans are not necessarily sometimes the enemy. Now Latinos are the enemy. And now the Chinese are the enemy. Latinos because they're not from here. That's the perception and the Oriental or Chinese because they bring in the coronavirus. You see the way they, they're behaving. So how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to educate and become more uh, respectful of others? Because we live in an intertwined world. Everybody has to deal with one another. And this is what's happening. This other, I'm, pro I'm sure you probably have seen that, that boy that was victim of bullying and his mother It posted that video. I think she's from um, Australia, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so those are the same things that are happening all over the world might be happening here. So as, what I'm trying to say is that we are in, a, even though it's a huge, big world, we, have, we are experiencing more or less the same situations. So it is, as I said, media and scholars have to be the beacon of light, have to be a successful in understanding quickly what is going on and able in, in and also being so successful in being able to carry a message and help others understand what is going on you have to translate to the general public what is happening and um, return to the basic crisis management in a crisis management plan that it's it occurs in a competitive environment basically if you have a, a crisis you have to plan your communications, how are you going to do it? So I think that's part of the role of journalists and most, of, most important scholars. You have to decode the message. You have to make them understand what's, what's behind the lines, what's behind what is being told. And uh, sometimes even the story has many faces. And I think the academia has the uh, obligation or to, to explain to the public 
because there's so much information in that in that environment you have to be as i said the the beacon um there's a story uh, as i said some reporters we reporters go to the place and we make the questions we're supposed to translate what they're saying and give it to the public but sometimes reporters are not able to decode clearly the message and when you see the stories are confusing so you you know, uh, that ho opens the space for other people to do it on social media, and sometimes social media is not correct. So, in a sense, what makes sense in, in all that in, is education, and, and in, in that respect, scholars have the, the uh, main role. There's a story this uh, recently, I think it was last week, about Al Pacino breaking up with his girlfriend. I don't know if you, if you saw it, that it came on, on the story. And the main story was that. It, she left him because she said that he was so it was hard to be with such an old man and it was the, that was the the headline everywhere that she was tired because she was an old man and that he was stingy he didn't want to uh, share the money something like that and and then the the story behind this as, as i said nobody she, the, her name of the actress is a uh, uh, dohan i think she said she was she was uh, she broke up with him because he didn't want to spend money. So the question is, was she behind his money? She was after her his money, or she was after, or she was in love with him? So in this situation, even though it's a entertainment in the, a story in the entertainment world, I would say there there's a need for an explanation. A feminist sociologist should go out and explain the dynamics and try to create uh, clear the the environment and and, and make the store the make the media be more just in terms of covering the story are they uh, discriminating against him because he's old he, he's an elder or or are they being sexist against her so those are the some uh, aspects that I, I don't see explained in, in any of the articles that I have seen so far about this story. So I think there's an opportunity, and I, I, I just wanted to, send, uh, to, to present a small example of where the universities can come and, and, and make uh, conversations about other, up, uh, other aspects of a story that will make us understand what is going on. You have to adapt to all the changes because everything is so, so quick. You have to be prepared, and that applies both to journalists and to scholars uh, you have to adapt quickly to the changes you also uh, like in a basketball ga uh, game you know that sometimes you wanted the the tallest players to play but now it doesn't matter if you're that tall what it matters is that you're fast and you know you, you have the three pointers you, you, you can shoot for three pointers that's more important than being tall so that's the adaptability that i'm talking about <laughs> Um, so you have to identify how to how to be prepared, how to communicate, and how you be prepared, how to be prepared in these times. And my perspective, coming from the communications world, I would say would be using the basic crisis plan. You have to anticipate the crisis. That means you know something is going to happen. Perhaps it's a, an earthquake or. A, political scandal or a mismanagement case in the university or the vice president is here in Lansing and says something that is against the, the governor and they want a reaction from a scholar. So you have to anticipate something that might happen and, and identify who's going to be the spokesperson, create a, a crisis team and train that person to be able to ask those to, to understand the, uh, the, uh, the world, the communications uh, world, and be able to not freeze in front of a camera, be able to answer the questions, establish uh, a, a notification and monitoring systems in case of a crisis, and how are you gonna respond to other departments and to other communities and to other stakeholders that you have. Uh, quickly develop holding statements, assess the situation, adapt the key messages if you have them, and then after the crisis, happens you have to analyze what you did right and you what you did wrong so that's some of some of some of those are the basic recommendations that anybody would do on a crisis situation and i will apply that if i were a, a scholar to any situation any particular situation 
So you have to get into the rhythm. I, I like to talk to you a little bit about my experience during Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria, particularly Hurricane Maria, because that changed my perspective in terms of how I cover the story and how, how I communicate what I was seeing. And it was so hard for me to explain because I, it got to a point that I was physically tired, emotionally drained, very sentimental, and I was so tired after working straight for 24 hours. And the first two weeks I slept on the floor of the radio station that I was uh, volunteering and uh, I was tired. Sometimes I, people would come with the stories and I would cry. I cried every single day during that coverage. And I don't know if you, if you know in Puerto Rico, and I think I told that to the class this morning that uh, there was a, I have written a column saying that the telecommunications uh, was going to be, was going to have a, a, a problem because they were not investing money in, in improving the system. And that if there was a hurricane to come or something, they were going to be, we were going to be left out without communication. The, the head of the communications board said that I was crazy, <laughs> basically. And then the first hurricane came, destroyed the telecommunications in the eastern coast of the island. Two weeks later, came Maria, and also not only destroyed the telecommunications, but also the radio stations and the TV stations. So there was no way of knowing what was going on. So I, I was turning to the radio, and I went to, there was only one radio network working, covering the entire island. There were tiny little stations throughout the island, but that was the only one. And I just went there. I drove there with coffee and a mug of coffee and, and sandwiches because they were working for 24 hours straight. And they were surprised when they saw me. And, and I thought that I, I, I went there to write some headlines for the newscast. And they said, no, we need you to talk because they, they don't have voice. They don't have a voice. They, they, I mean, they're tired. So I went there and I said, to all, any of the reporters who are available, if you want to come here and be a volunteer, and 70 reporters showed up from competing stations. So we were there for the first few, the first two weeks were crazy. And we were sleeping on the floor and people were showing up there. The uh, emergency office, for, uh, the emergency center, the you know, government's emergency center flooded. So they went to the station. There was no internet. I mean, nobody knew what was going on except for what we hear on the radio. So I stay there uh, for, I mean, I stopped working I, in, in my things. I just went there to work as a volunteer because I, I knew there was a need to do it. And I, people would come and make lines, 500, 600 people per day, basically to give you a little piece of paper to tell you, my name is Juan Perez and I live in, my, my parents live in Ponce, which is in the South. I want you to tell them that I'm alive. So I would go on the microphone and I said, if there's any relative of this man, he's alive. And somebody might have listened to that in, up in the mountains and would walk to another town to tell them, oh, I heard your son said that he was alive. That's how we, we found out. The, the, the very first, I would say, month of the emergency. It was, it was completely chaos. Imagine that. And don't, don't do that, Jomaira, because then I won't be able to talk. It was very emotional because you don't know if your relatives are alive and people died. So we have to deal with that on the air. I'm going to show you. Jomaira, no te vaya. Don't, don't leave. And then I have some of the experiences that I have, I, I narrate on my, on my book. On this road, I was driving my brand new car and it almost fell, so it broke. One of, I, I damaged my car there. And these two pictures, like a week after I tried to do my hair, I went to the salon and that was, that's one of my hairdressers. And I saw him and I'm like, oh, you're so skinny. Have you lost weight? And he said, no, I'm on a diet. And I was like, yeah, you're not dying. You're eating some chips. You're not going to lose weight. And then one of the girls told me, he's, he, he's not, he also want to tell you, but he lost his house. And I'm like, what, 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 what are you talking about? And he's, he's, um, he's on, a, on, a, on a gay relationship with this other man. I think they married. His relatives didn't want him to, I mean, basically threw him out of his house. And he had, you know, like, that happens to some people. So, so he went to the street and, and he worked as a hairdresser to be able to go to school and to study. 
and and to finish his degree and he has his i i know i think he's now finished his degree but the thing is that when the flood came the house flooded completely he lost the computer he lost everything so he only had the the clothes that he had he had put on and that was his house and that's his partner look at the mud all the way up so how do you convey that to the public when you have an emotional situation you have to tell that those are pictures that i took i put that on my because some people were seeing the stories from social media there were there were reporters from the united states david bagnot and some other from from the new york times and sometimes i would talk to them and i said why don't you go to this place or talk to this other person or you know talk to somebody that that was the way i i, I was able to communicate what was going on sometimes i would post those pictures on social media and people might get some signals in some areas and that's how they found out these are some other pictures of people who were their houses destroyed that was not the earthquake that was the hurricane a whole building so that i took some pictures those of the elderly people that that man passed away um desperation was relentless people were getting sick the elderly were dying um I don't know. It's just that uh, many of the people were left out by their children, and that happens in Puerto Rico, and I'm sure it's happening here in the in the United States. That uh, the culture is being uh, aimed at the youth. So what, after you're 50, you're over the hill, <laughs> so they don't want to take care of you, as in other traditions that they respect the elderly. So in Puerto Rico, most of them were left alone. And when the hurricane happened, many died because of that. So that was a really bad situation. And us as reporters, as I tell you, it was hard. It was hard to tell you. And, and you have to confront the reality and ask the tough questions to politicians that got me into a lot of trouble. Um, that was in the town of Loisa. Loisa is in a town. I took that picture with my cell phone, my other phone, not this one, the other one. And um, a man, I don't know if you see that man around here. Let me show it to you, right here. This man, the winds blew and his house fell on top of him and he was able to escape the, the water and, uh, and uh, I interviewed him because I went to see what was going on. During the day, I would go out to see what was happening and then at night, I would go to the station to, re to tell the stories that I was finding out on the streets. If you want to see, or if you want to listen to some of that, I was one of the nights I was interviewed by a reporter from National Public Radio who was there at the station and she heard about what we were doing and that the government and the military were coming to the station because it was the only one, the only thing that was there. And she was, she came and when she was there with us, a lady, a woman that was a sexually um, harassed, sexually attacked. She was, she was raped, came to the station asking for help. And she walked many miles. So uh, I had to deal with that. And you're not a psychologist. I'm a reporter. I'm a simple human being. So how can I do, how can I deal with that? When people would call and said, I want to kill myself on the air. So what I did is that on the radio, I begged for professionals, the psychologists from the university. Some of the universities came and brought in people that helped us and went to the station and we, we developed, we placed little tents outside of the station to receive aid and also to have psychologists and psychiatrists. And a psychiatrist came and helped me and stayed with me all the time that I was on the air because some people called and, and were telling us their stories. And, I mean, there were some people sick who wanted to commit suicide, and how do you handle that? I don't have the tools to do it. So I, I, I am grateful that the university professors helped me in, in that. So that's an example of how journalists and the academia can work together. This is me on one of those nights on the station. We had, I was completely tired. We were working for hours, hours and hours. Jose, which is behind, right next to me, um, was also a volunteer. The only one, the only regular reporter who worked at the station was the one in the middle. 
So the other ones, we were all uh, volunteers there and we're really tired. And then during the day, I would go out and help people to this, in different towns. I went to with some of, these are in the right photo. You see Adahitsa, who's a reporter. She also helped me and, and uh, Francisco in the middle. And the tall one is a psychiatrist who came and helped us. And we, I will say, oh, I need a, the nuns in this town told me that they need a, diapers for babies so people will go and and then at the the next day i would have 50 boxes of diapers so i would say please come and pick them up because i don't have a car sometimes i had to uh, take it to different places so that's what i did this is me and jesus it was three or three a.m in the morning i was tired completely tired this is me <laughs> i fell asleep on the, on the station and i try to put that that book is in spanish i know i have to translate because some people have asked for it it's included on that book then is my experience of what happened during the summer and how i, I mentioned that during the hurricane and what happened in, in the book and, and i summarize in in the book how i started asking questions to government officials and I was really mad because I knew the death toll was not correct what they were telling. It was a complete lie. I would never, I distinctly remember. And I have to, one day that day, it was so hard. Were they, were they deflating the numbers? Or deflating? deflating the numbers. <laughs> the governor kept saying that there were only 12 and then 16 and then 64. And then, you know, he was interviewed by one of the reporters and he said that uh, he was happy that there were only, the, the victims were, we were able to, to limit the amount of victims. When Trump came to Puerto Rico, they kept saying that there were only, uh, I think it was 34 that night. And then, <clears throat> you know, they placed his, his, his audio. And when I came into the studio, I was, inter I was gonna interview the mayor of Toabaja, a town that was severely hit by, by the water. And uh, when some of those pictures that I, I, I show you, and um, when I, I, I said, and with us is the mayor of Toabaja. And when I look at him, I have to go to break, to commercial because he was crying. Uh, and I was like, I don't know if he was tired. I was completely in shock. And I, and I said, what are you, what happening? What's happening? And he said, how can the governor said that when in my own town, I have 10 people that I have seen that, that passed away, so he's lying. So what, what should I do as a reporter? I talked to several professors and to community leaders to see if they can count on the, on, on the deaths. I know the, locally the uh, CNN and the um, Center for Investigative Journalists, they were researching and they had uh, a opposing numbers. So I knew from the beginning that they were lying. And I had this gut feeling as a journalist that something was going on, but I cannot pinpoint of what was happening in the government. And I knew they were lying to us. I remember that I wrote a, a column about how um, we needed like a memorial for the death. I have, in my, personally, I have 16 friends or relatives that pass away or people that I know that I pass away because, not because of the hurricane, after the hurricane, because they, they needed power to have ventilators or they got a, a stroke or they got depressed or whatever. My very best friend, uh, she was the head of, of the uh, human resources department for a big supermarket chain. And uh, she was working and she had her daughter with her at work that day. And she had a heart attack and she, and it was a, she was 46 years old woman. And she passed away and her body was at the, the forensics institute for three months they had bodies piled like we were in i don't know in a in crazy place and we were doing whatever it was possible to take her out of there to bury her body so we we couldn't even do that so i was mad personally mad because i knew they were lying so but i couldn't pinpoint to what was going on and I remember I, I wrote a, a column about a memorial that was needed for the public, for the people to just, you know, pass through that trauma of the death and nobody paid attention. And two artists, one of, both of them are reporters as well, uh, Rafael Acevedo and Gloribel Delgado, they decided to do a presentation 
in, in front of the Capitol building, the state Capitol, and they ask people to place the shoes of a relative or a friend who has passed away. And they put all the shoes, and it was impressive. You will see thousands of shoes right across of the Capitol. And, uh, it, and the first lady came to the media and she said, if they're having those many shoes, why don't they give us to the, 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 the why don't they give me those shoes for for me to give to the poor students at the public school system? She was making fun of, and I was like, I was so mad that I wrote something. I I know it was hard. I was really really hard on her, but but for me that was offensive, and that was the attitude that I saw in the government officials. They went because people were really upset. Then they went. And they saw those, the shoes and they took a photo, they took a photo and you know they left. So I kept writing and writing and writing things that something was going to happen. And then the then secretary of the Treasury Secretary said that um, in Puerto Rico there was what he calls an institutional mafia of corruption on some politicians. Immediately the governor fired him. It came after the um, the uh, arrests of the education secretary and the arrest of the health uh, services director. Both of them are uh, were arrested by the FBI, accused of stealing about it's a fraud of over fifteen million dollars in public funds. I remember that they have they were shutting down and closing schools, so there was very con there was a big controversy, and you have the treasury secretary saying about the mafia within the administration. So I said, something is going on. And then I received a contact from a source who told me, we have some information that you might be find interesting. And that was a chat. On July 9th, Noticel, the, blog, the, uh, the online site where I published my columns, they wrote that uh, the story saying, saying that they, had, they knew that there was a chat similar to a, a previous chat that had happened on, on, on WhatsApp. But, you know, they didn't, have, they didn't quite have the information. The source gave me the, the main chat. And, you know, I met with the source. I was with another reporter from the Centro de Periodismo Investigativo, the investigative center. Her name is Omaya Sosa. And we were there. And when I saw the person, and I said, I think you have the document. I want to see the, the entire document. No, I don't have it. When we were going to leave, I had this feeling. I said, I have to go back. You have it there. Let me see it. So she it sent me, it's, I was able to see the, the document, some of the documents. So I took my cell phone. I started uh, taking pictures. That's where he called her a councilwoman. And that's where the governor stated something like that. And that, you know, mis misogynistic really bad words. I mean, it was really offensive. They offended everybody, the elderly, the deaf, the, the LGBT communities, the poor, the opposition. It was really bad. So I wrote that article and I had no idea it was going to be viral. I got calls from The Guardian, from The New York Times the next day. Everybody was talking about that. I, I was even surprised. Then the following day, I, I did a follow-up story because I got more pages, more offense. And, and the title is Más humillaciones a la mujer desde la fortaleza, more, eh, eh, ¿cómo se dice humillación? Humiliation against women from the governor's mansion, la fortaleza, gracias. So, and that, that was on July the 12th, and then on July the 13th, the entire document was made public, and that's when all hell broke loose, and that's when the protests started during the summer. During that period, people were on those, out of the streets eh, protesting, and I was writing. I was telling, I told this morning on, on the class that I, in a period of, of almost three weeks, I wrote more than 50 articles investigating what was going on. It was, I mean, I was working every single day and people, and the thing, it was so uh, intense because I was tweeting what I was writing and I would put the, the date and the hour of the things that I was finding out and people were following it, everything that I was doing. And uh, I got this second chat of the then Secretary of Justice Secretary, now Governor, who basically was talking to the former Secretary of of, of the Treasury, saying that she didn't want to she didn't want to um, investigate 
what was going on with the aid that was supposedly given to the people during the hurricane because she didn't want to prosecute the first lady. So I made that public. It was a big situation. And then on July the 3rd, 31st, I published the second part of the chat, 125 pages additional to the 800. And in that particular chat, they made fun of me. They, they made, in the first chat, they made a meme, a meme, a meme, a meme, a meme out of me, a meme, in Espanol, a meme out of me. So they put the president of the, of the, of the Senate, like sending me a, a kiss. They had all the other remarks against my, on, on the other ones, asking them to do something to me and to, you know, basically they, they, they threatened me. And, um, and specifically put my name and other names. I'm, I was not the only one. They, all, they also mentioned other reporters as well. So that's one my, my experience. I was personally attacked in some regards. And uh, I tried to, I mentioned that example, not because I want to be seen as the victim or as a hero, because I'm not, neither of those. But simple, simply because it can happen to anyone. It can happen to anyone, anybody of us. I'm no hero. I'm not victim either just that it doesn't matter no matter a place where you live your race your gender your age it can happen the, the world is changing quite quickly it's changing fast and um, we cannot remain hidden in us in an office doing research we have to be out there on the streets we have to talk and 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 be there be present with the with the struggles with the, of the people and scholars have a an obligation to do that, particularly on this time, this day and age, with all so many changes that are taking place in the, in the world, scholars ought to be there, helping the communities, even guiding the, the media with all the confusion that I just mentioned. So as I said, uh, they cannot remain in the classrooms. They have to be on the street because as I said, they respond to the public. And my goal, we might be battered, like that picture, we might be broken, but we're still there, hanging in there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hang on for questions. For the recording. Okay. Um, I'm a long time. I'm a longtime newspaper woman, and I want to know if if your news organization was owned by the government or was uh, privately owned or an independent. Well, uh, the newspaper that I I'm an independent re uh, journalist. Okay. The, independent. So you're like a freelancer. You call that? I have a yeah, I have a syndicated program that that is okay. on on the radio. It's it belongs. It's part of the. Radio Informativa, Red, eh, Red Informativa de Puerto Rico, or the Informative Network of Puerto Rico, which is made of, of independent, privately owned stations, radio stations. The same as in Noticel, the website is privately owned. It's not owned by the government. It's not owned by the government. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I found that very interesting. Did you ever feel threatened? By did you feel threatened by the stories you're reporting? Well, I, I and I mentioned that in in the morning, um, right after the hurricane, because I kept pressing and making those questions, the tough questions. Um, I was not leaving in my house because I hadn't. Where I lived, the only house that was left without power in the entire place was my house, and I think I think they were punishing me a little bit. So. You know, when I live with my parents' house, they live right next to me. So, you know, at, at the end of the street. And um, one, I have my house is, has a security all over. I, we didn't have any electricity. We didn't have power, but it's locked. The, the house was secure. And they, somebody came and vandalized my property. And destroyed, and basically vandalized all the building, all the walls and the papers. They didn't steal anything. So the police said that they were trying to send me a, to, to a message. And you know what I did? I took my cell phone, I took pictures, I did a Facebook Live, I put the pictures on, on the internet and I said, I'm not gonna be threatened. And I put the pictures on my book 
and I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing. I have to do it. And months after, that's when we reveal the chat. You, don't have, you cannot be threatened because otherwise you won't be doing your job. And, I, and I, I, as I said, I'm not a hero. I'm not a hero. I'm not a victim. I'm simply doing what I'm supposed to do as a reporter, telling the truth, relating what I see. And in a, in a moment of confusion, such as the hurricane or the earthquake, people were needing that information. People are demanding that information. So I think that was a moral and, and a, an obligation that we have as, as journalists to, to convey that information. So I think that was my role back then, and, and I still do. People hated me. You have no idea. I was telling Tamara this morning that um, the government had an entire operation of trolls and bots, and it has been written all over. You can find that uh, if you Google it. And they had people saying so many things about us reporters, about me. Oh, terrible things. And, you know, I get... Uh, screen saving, <laughs> taking pictures of, of, of everything, all the insults. Because I said, that has to be made by a computer. That's part of the strategy. They want to, you know, make me shut up. I'm not, I'm not going to shut up. I got to find out what's going on. And then that was the, the chat. When the chat happened, when we revealed the chat, the trolls stopped bothering me. And when I'm taking, uh, telling you about the way they were harassing me, they, they even printed photos of my house on Twitter, the front of my home on Twitter. They put faces like uh, with uh, like bruises on my, ha on my face, like they uh, photoshopped the, the, the face with horns. They would, put, they would put my face like I was a pig. They would call me nigger. They would call me all the names that you have no, whore, all the names that you have no idea they would, they would say. And not only to me, they did that to some of the other reporters that were making the questions. So that's a method that they're trying to employ to threaten journalists. Locally in Puerto Rico, journalists have not been killed so far as in other, I should not laugh, but it, I'm just saying in, in other places, in Mexico, in Latin America, journalists are, are being killed. So we have some constitutional guarantees. But I think at, at the end of, the, of, the, of everything, you have to do what you're supposed to do. And people need to know what's, go what's happening. And uh, it's incredible when people are in need. The fact that information, aid, food was being hidden. I mean, people had the right to know that. So that's, that's what I was doing. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I appreciate what you said about the need for scholars to speak up and look at information and translate it for the people and get it out there. And we do need to be more nimble and we do need to be more out there. But another thing that those of us who've been in academia for a while also know is that reporters don't often come to us for that. And also often when they do, the soundbite that they take out of it, it was not the one that you would have chosen or that is actually the key part mm -hmm. of it. And I was wondering what you had maybe to say about how we could work better together because right now it, we don't do that so well in, in our no, country. I, I appreciate that you say that. I think that most, most universities and any organization should provide all the employees, in this case professors, with media training. You have to understand the way the media works. And you might be in a conference like this, we've been talking for an hour, and they're only gonna put on the air one minute, and if they're lucky, one minute and 50 seconds, 15 seconds on TV. And a story right now, a current study, a, a written story, article on a newspaper or an online site is no longer than 500 words. So how can you tell everything that you have to say in 500 words? You have to work, you have to talk in what politicians are being a master on, which is talking in sound bites. Go get to the point, be clear, be precise. I know uh, the academics tend to explain things. Professors, tend, I mean, you go, you're in a classroom, you have to explain. But if you're talking to the media, you have to go 
back to basics, simple. That's why I, need, I, I say that I, I recommend professors to take media training so they understand. Politicians are far out, uh, uh, you know, more, more advanced than, than the rest of us because they, they take those classes, they go to campaigns and elections uh, trainings in Washington and they learn how to talk in sound bites. And they, they learn how to go back to the main topic and how to repeat. And they learn how to move, how to move their hands, how to look at the camera, you know, how to smile. They know how, what to wear. So us citizens and professors particularly must understand that. And believe me, it's a, I know a journalist, we, we, I mean, we have a, a deadline, we have a limited amount of space. But if we need, if we go reach out to a professor, that's it is because we need that sort of information. And if you become a, um, an assistant uh, or a, a help for us reporters, they're, they're going to go back. So the, the important thing is that my recommendation is to understand the way the media is, try to be a, a, speak in shorter sentences. Remember that. Uh, I know it's, it's hard, but what they call it when you when you give an interview, have three main uh, the main topic that you're going to talk, and then one or two other ideas. Don't go out and do the thesis and explain the thesis there because they're not going to have the time and the patience to talk about that. But you go one point and then two one or two uh, ideas that are going to support that message that message that you mentioned. If the message is short, 21 words the minimum, that's going to be probably the headline of the, of the story, if it's a good message. So that you, it's hard. I mean, policies, they, they do that for clients in the corporate world. Why don't professors do that? And, I, and my recommendation is that the communication school or the uh, advertising professors here should give those seminars to other professors. That's, I always do that. I always tell them to professors in in universities because you have information that is needed sometimes there are academic theses that they get lost in the in the uh, libraries nobody's gonna read them unless you know how to present it to the public and maybe it becomes something important that people might find interested or needed so you have to learn how to how to communicate and also you have I mean the internet was created on an university setting use the internet Use the available tools, use video to communicate, to, to engage, participate in, group, get in groups, get to know the community organizers and the local media, the local reporters, and they, they will find you as a, as a resource that is important for them. And they, they, they may turn you into a, an expert that you are. <laughs> so that's my recommendation. That's okay. what I would you're welcome. So that we all have our goal, boil your theses down to 21 words. That's the message. That's, the, that's your 21 words. Boil yeah, it down to 20, 21 words. All right, let's give Sandra another thank round you. of thank yous. Thank you. Thank you. So much, Sandra. Uh, we appreciate and are humbled by your participation in the Global Engagement Speaker Series. I also want to thank you for the many visits and meetings in which you're participating you. this week on campus. I'm told that we're keeping you very busy. Yeah. Um, Great. Yeah, I appreciate I'm, I'm all your time. Fun. So international studies and that's my hair. <laughs> international studies and programs, university outreach and engagement, and the graduate school would like to thank the co-sponsors listed on the screen for their support of Sandra's visit to Michigan State University. We have one more speaker in the 2020 Global, Global Engagement Speaker Series. The series welcomes Cosmos Ochiang on March 24th. Cosmos Milton Obote Ocheng is the director of the African Natural Resources Center, or the ANRC, at the African Development Bank in Abidjan, Ivory Coast. He's an expert in global development policy with particular interests in natural resources governance, agriculture and real, rural development, climate change and green growth, and science, technology, and society. For further information about speakers and to view video recordings of their talks, please visit the series website at ges.msu.edu. And finally, please join Sandra and the Global Engagement Speaker Series team for a reception of light refreshments in the room next door, over that way. Thank you for joining us today and have a very pleasant rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.